Good morning. Good morning. Uh, right. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Victor Manjarez. I am the director for the Center for Law and Human Behavior. And uh, so I am uh, uh, responsible for the symposium series that we have. This is a, a Department of Homeland Security grant funded through the Office of uh, Terrorism Prevention or Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention. On that. So one of the, the part of this grant is that uh, uh, our aim was to connect research with practice, right? To try to make that, that connection that, that's being done. So, so as, as this aspect of the grant has proceeded, is I started looking at different resources in terms of who's done some research in, in these topics. And so I looked at the National Institute of Justice, which has done, has done extensive uh, research in, in this area. The University of Maryland START program, which was a Department of Homeland Security Center of Excellence. That's conducted a, a ton of research as, as, as well on this. And I also looked at the pro, uh, private sector. So we have a series of symposiums that we have uh, planned out for the next uh, two years. So this is the, the first of this aspect of the grant, but not first or not the first one of the symposium series. This is actually number 17 of, of, of the symposium series that, that we've conducted in, 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 the, in the past. Um, so and we'll, we'll continue to have these approximately every quarter, exception for the, the exception of the next one, uh, kind of catches, catches us up. We were originally scheduled to have uh, two presenters, uh, Dr. Barnett Coven, uh, as you can imagine, coming from the East Coast, right in, into uh, flight troubles uh, on that, uh, the carriers on that, so he's not going to uh, be here. But Ms. Rachel Gabriel, uh, will, uh, who is his colleague in terms of all the work that you'll see, was hand in hand with uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Colvin on that. If it, in fact, he asked Dr. Colvin, and he would tell you that Ms. Rachel Gabriel led the effort uh, on that. He told me that several times, actually, uh, led, the, uh, uh, led the effort. So, uh, so uh, uh, Ms. Rachel uh, Gabriel, just to give you a little bit of background uh, of, of her, uh, she's a privacy policy manager for Amazon Alexa. And uh, um, she started this work, or this work originated when she was doing work at the University of Maryland as a researcher for that START program, which, uh, which the, the START is an acronym. It's the, it's the Study of Terrorism and Response to Terrorism. Again, it's a DHS funded uh, 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 center of excellence. And so she did a lot of her work there. She continues to have a, a, an interest in this topic. She loves to be able to speak to others about this topic. Uh, on that, And she's uh, this morning speaking, uh, speaking with her. She's really looking forward to the speaking of this type of makeup of people, with the vast majority of, of, of you know, the law enforcement community, community and have an interest on, uh, on that. So I certainly encourage you to ask some questions. Uh, 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 throughout there, this is uh, the, the opportunity, hopefully to provide some insight in something that you, uh, you may not have uh, a lot of knowledge about. So again, thank you. And at this time, Ms. Gable. Hello, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Um, I am Rachel Gabriel. Thank you for the introduction, Vic. Um, I am just going to give you a really quick background on START and me and Barnett and the work that we did. So START is a national consortium for the study of terrorism and responses to terrorism. Barnett and I worked on the political instability near peer competition um, and counterterrorism portfolios, which is a catch-all basically for everything that you could think related to political instability. So we didn't just study jihadism, right-wing extremism. Um, we kind of looked at, you know, Russian misinformation, disinformation campaigns. So we have a big breadth of knowledge. Unfortunately, he was not able to be here with us today. Um, I'm sorry that you guys are missing out on him, but I will try and give do his presentation uh, justice. So I am currently at Amazon Alexa doing privacy policy. And you're probably thinking, how did you go from terrorism to tech? And I hope that uh, throughout this presentation, you're going to get a sense for how all of these things and all of these technologies are really interrelated, are really connected, and the thing that they're connected by is machine learning, right? So the implications for machine learning are vast and wide, um, and it's all around you, as we will discuss uh, later. But as Vic said, um, I it will be not so interesting for me and not so interesting for you if I just stand here and talk to you for 50 minutes. So as much as I'm hoping that you will learn from me, I would love to learn from you too. Hear about your experiences in your jobs, in your homes, in your societies, things that you have experienced. Um, and I think that that would really enrich the 
discussion for all of us. Uh, so please don't hesitate to jump in if you have a question. Uh, all I ask is that you just say your name, um, where you're from, what agency you work at, um, and then what your interest is in being in this symposium. Uh, are we all good? Awesome. So social media and violent extremism. This graphic comes from the Countering Terrorism Center at West Point. And I laughed when I first saw it, despite myself, it's not funny. But really, this is the way that information warfare is being waged. In the 21st century, mechanical warfare, human warfare is not the way that wars are being waged. Wars are being waged via information online, whether that's person to person, whether that's social media, whether that's, you know, even like big news media outlets and how they're shaping opinions. That's really where the war is fought and that's really where the war is won. Who is better at getting their message out there? Who is better at getting people to adopt their message? Um, and so that's really, it's, it's kind of an interesting graphic, but it really is true. Um, so before I start, I just kind of want to get a sense for, uh, you know, what we're working with here, because a lot of this is going to be about social media. How many of you use any social media? Okay, good. Um, how many of you are on Facebook? How many of you are on Instagram? How many of you are on Reddit or have been on Reddit? How, I, I guess the question is how many of you are familiar? Okay, all right. Um, how many of you use TikTok? Okay, well. <laughs> you're, you're gonna see why I'm asking these questions. No, you're okay. In the first 50 minute block, we're really going to talk about social media and violent extremism and the evolution of how social media has been used by violent extremists and how it has changed from, you know, the inception of Al Qaeda on the internet all the way now to, you know, the offshoots of Islamic State. And if we're talking about a domestic, um, a domestic manifestation of that is some right wing extremism stuff, um, you know, there's a bunch of different groups that we'll talk about. Um, but so that's what we're going to do for the first section. Um, the Q&A is, you know, I hope that this whole thing is a Q&A, but if there are any outstanding questions at the end. Um, and then the second block, we're going to talk about a project that Burnett and I did about fashion forecasting and how we adapted influencer marketing methodologies to look at the spread of extremism on the internet. Okay, so our background. Clearly, um, you know, you can tell that I'm the person who's standing with the, uh, with the military there. I don't actually know where he was, but no, that's not me, that's Barnett. Um, I actually developed an interest in tech when I was in uh, a master's student at the London School of Economics. I was doing international relations and conflict studies. And um, during that time, ISIS was kind of really in its heyday. That was uh, 2014. So that's when ISIS was really starting to pick up, right? Um, and we were looking at the way that they were using the internet and how different that was than Al Qaeda and the extremist groups that had come before them. And so I decided to write my dissertation on the diffusion of extremist narratives on social media um, in the wake of the Arab Spring. So I am Egyptian, full disclosure. Uh, so if I'm speaking, you know, about something cultural, that's that's why. Um, so that's kind of where I became very interested in that. Then I worked at START. Um, and so this picture, picture with Madeleine Albright, um, I did a civic tech leadership program, which was ironically funded by the Bezos Institution, and now I work for Amazon, but there is no conflict of interest at the time, I promise. Um, and we really looked at the role of technology uh, in solving societal problems, and a big part of that was terrorism. So something that Madeleine Albright said that really stuck with me was counterterrorism. She was wearing a snail pin. She wears a different pin every day. And she said, counterterrorism is like this snail slow. You have to be in it for the long haul. You can't quick fixes. I'm sure that you guys have heard of unknown unknowns. You try and squash one problem, five other problems pop up. But the real work is being done here with all of us on the ground. I truly believe that there is no government intervention and there is no technological panacea for what we're going to talk about today. What is the thing that's going to save us, if anything is gonna save us, is being open and honest and building trust in our communities, building trust with our students, building trust with law enforcement. Um, as a society, this is something that we have to take upon ourselves to fix. No tech company is gonna do it for you. No amount of money that the government's gonna allocate is gonna do it. It's 
kind of up to all of us. So that being said, um, Al Qaeda's media landscape. I'm not going to go through all of these different uh, media outlets for you. I'm just going to kind of give you a big overview of why this is important. If at any point you have questions about specifics, please raise your hands and let me know. So Al Qaeda obviously emerged before the 21st century rise of social media. But the reason that Al Qaeda was so important is they really revolutionized the terrorism and violent extremism propaganda tactic and strategy, right? So they were responsible really for producing all of this content that they would then in a very controlled way, filter down through media distribution companies. So this was like, you know, this was like a whole operation. Like you could see like, you know, there are all, all, all these online news channels, um, you know, the Young Turks, things like that. That was basically how they were. They were like a full media operation. And then what they would do is their media distribution would then filter that down to online forums. So we're not talking about social media here. We're talking about forums that were existed online. There were 18 different forums actually that they did this with. This was a really smart strategy because they had really tight control over the narratives that they were disseminating. And not anybody could just stumble onto these forums. I suppose it's possible, but in general, you had to know someone. You had to be invited into the group. And so their control over the narrative was very strong. The other thing is, if one of these forums gets taken down, no problem. You just take put it, put up another one, put up another one. So they really kind of revolutionized this idea of being agile while making sure that they were still in control of the narrative. And so this is extremely important. It's not what they were saying or how they were saying it. It was the fact that they made themselves so flexible and agile that it was nearly impossible to shut them down, right? And because the community that was on these web forums was smaller at the time, it was very easy to get the word out that this forum has been closed, but go to this forum. And that's how they started to build community, right? Um, and, you know, at this point, they weren't like getting tons of foreign fighters from the West. This was kind of like a self-contained mechanism. Um, you can think of Al Qaeda uh, back in that day as like a Harvard or a Yale, right? Really prestigious. You had to be creme de la crop to get invited, right? Um, you, not anybody could just say, oh, I want to be a member of Al Qaeda, right? There was a very high bar. They had a lot more, I guess, an idea that this was something um, that you had to earn, right? Not anybody could just say, I'm Al Qaeda, right? Um, and so from this perspective, you can kind of see how this is something that's gonna get blown open with the advent of social media as we know it today, right? Um, so moving on, oh, well, okay. So actually this is important. So key ideologues and independent blogs. Um, how many of you are familiar with, uh, you know, Islam in general, like the religion, the way it's structured? Okay, so some of you. Um, the problem with Islam is that there is nobody who authoritatively speaks in the name of Islam, right? So in Shia Islam, there is the Ayatollah, and he does speak for, you know, the Shia Muslims, but Sunni Muslims, it's like Protestantism. There's no Pope, there's nothing. And in the absence of that, there's really no religious authority to say, yes, this is correct. This is the correct way to interpret the Quran, or this is the intent. It, I'm not going to go through a whole religious lecture right now, <laughs> but um, it's, it's very open to interpretation in a way even more um, unclear than the Bible because the Quran is not really written in the same fashion as the Bible. It's very, very open to interpretation. So then you have these key ideologues, right? And there's the advent of YouTube and there's the advent of, you know, like radio and the Al Jazeera generation. And they're saying, we're speaking in the name of Islam. And there are people, even though their views are extreme, right, who are going to gravitate towards that for one reason or another. And in the absence of a religious authority, you have all of these competing views, and it's very easy for people to grasp onto extremist ideas, right? Then you have these independent blogs that are run by some of these, like, you know, we call them um, like YouTube muftis or whatever, where they will just make themselves into really like reputable figures, even though they have basically no credentials, right? And they'll sit and they'll make a YouTube channel and they make a blog, right? And that's how you kind of draw people in, right? 
And then you funnel them to these web forums where the actual extremist conversation is happening. Maybe some of the terrorist plotting is happening. That's kind of how you funnel down. But the thing to know is this is very much a top down effort, very controlled, top down, right? Very tightly controlled. Um, and then you have, sorry, kind of went about this backwards, but then you have social media, you can see how it sort of funnels down, but then it'll also funnel back up because the sort of YouTube Mufti will funnel people back to the web forums, will funnel people back to the ideologues and it goes up and down, but the narrative top down. So the Islamic State's media landscape. Um, so in probably the 2010s, early, early 2010s, the Islamic State's media strategy was very similar to Al-Qaeda's, right? How many of you know that the Islamic State came out of um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq? Yeah. So it was very similar to Al-Qaeda's media strategy. They had these productions and distribution centers, and they were kind of, you know, learning from Al-Qaeda. Um, and so Al-Qaeda then felt that they were losing control with as social media began to get more popular of their very like tight narrative, right? And so you have all of these people from ISIS now who are putting things out there and there's more democratization in the early years. Then with the advent of like social media as we know it today, right? That's when the real democratization happens. Who better to propagandize, right? Because the Islamic State was really looking to attract foreign fighters, was looking to spread their message far and wide. Who better to propagandize to Americans, to 30,000 Americans, than an American, right? If I'm listening to some person from Iraq and I'm American, it's very unlikely that their message is going to resonate with me, right? However, if the American takes that narrative of grievance, who knows like what like grievance means? Grievance is the thing that you are upset about. Uh, and I think that the thing to remember throughout this entire presentation is that grievance is the thing that mobilizes people. And I always start with this, and I'm sorry that I haven't spoken about this in like a year and a half, but terrorism is inherently political, okay? Maybe it's wrapped up in a religious ideology. Maybe it's wrapped up in some sort of other ideology, but in its essence, terrorism is political. It's a political vehicle. And grievance is the thing that really motivates people. So like, what are you upset about? And that's really the brilliance of this social media strategy is that they really democratize the ability for people to be able to relate to people's grievances. My grievances as an American are not going to be the same as an Iraqi's grievances, right? And so what they did was they really expanded the reach of their narrative and the reach of their ideology by appealing to people's grievances directly, right? So this was a big media campaign. Um, and so you can kind of see how it starts up with the productions and the distributors, then it goes to the channels, and then it goes to the consumers, the supporters, the unaligned population, and the enemies. And this is how in the early 2010s, this went. Then you have the advent of social media and the whole thing explodes. Um, there was some, somebody gave a lecture at Start Once. I can't remember who it is, probably good because it's funny, but it's not funny. So. <laughs> Al-Qaeda, Harvard and Yale, you have to work really hard, you have to have credentials, you have to pedigree, you have to apply. ISIS, you could get a black flag and a white piece of chalk, right? I'm ISIS in Ohio, stick it on your front lawn, and now you are ISIS in Ohio, right? So you can see how through the diffusion of social media, it makes it very easy for anybody to say, now I'm speaking on behalf of Islamic State. And that's good for them. They don't actually care, unlike Al-Qaeda, which wanted to maintain very tight control of the narrative. So if you look now, the Islamic State's media translation channels. So you have this big production distribution, uh, I guess, um, structure similar to Al-Qaeda. Then you have translation channels in all of these different languages, right? So now you're not just trying to shut down terrorist web forums. You're trying to shut down all of these official news sources plus all of the social media offshoots in those respected languages, right? And you shut down one, there's always gonna be another one popping up. So this will kind of give you a sense of like how wide the reach is. And all of these different channels are appealing to people's grievances in those areas. So this, if you take one thing away from this block, 
is this is the strategy of the Islamic State. And to be honest, it's brilliant and also frightening. Uh, this is, you know, what should scare all of us. But this is also something that uh, I hope will be motivating. So basically, you go into a conflict zone, right, where there are Shia fighters, men, weapons, and then you pour fuel on the fire. I'm sorry if I'm actually getting ahead of myself here. So ISIS, Al Qaeda, that those groups are Sunni groups. That is one sect of Islam. Shia, that's the Iranian sort of um, domain of Islam. That's a different sect of Islam. And I'm not going to go into the whole history of these uh, disputes, but they don't like each other, <laughs> for, for lack of a better word. And in Iraq, the reason that this really became, the reason that the rise of the Islamic State happened was because the Shia were in control of the government and the Sunnis used to be in control of the government and then the Sunnis were disenfranchised and that's how this whole thing became such a big issue. So using this narrative of being, you know, aggrieved, being sort of um, transgressed again, against, you go into an area where there are Shia men, weapons, etc., and you pour fuel on the fire and you send in Sunni men, you send in money, you send in weapons. And then when they go, when, when these men go, they're, the narratives that they're putting forth are this is the duty of, th this is their duty to do this. Um, you know, they are honorable fighters. They are fighting for Allah. They're fighting for their people. They're fighting in a war that honestly they're creating, but that's not the narrative, right? Um, and so you have all of these narratives of success and you're having it like being being televised to the entire world. You're having these fighters go in. You're having them get really strong footage of like battle. And you have all of the comments that they're encouraging each other and like, you know, God bless you. Like, thank you for fighting this holy war. Thank you for fighting on behalf of us. And this is basically the narrative, right? Like they're doing something amazing. It is honorable. It is good. They are fighting for God, right? And they're filming it. And so this is going to inspire a lot of people who are now being drawn in and they're looking at their grievances and they're saying, oh, wow, look at these guys who are fighting for me, right? They're doing all of this for me. I want to go do that, right? And so then you have personalized propaganda that comes out of this. You send someone in a war zone and you're like, okay, you're going to target like the Uzbeks and you're going to say this and you're going to put this video and then that's going to reach all of these people. And so you're having sort of this like personalized propaganda that appeals to people directly. Um, and that's like a really important thing to understand is that it is really a cycle. All of these wars, all of these things, it all feeds into the same cycle. Fighting, honorable people, social media, then more people enter the cycle. And it goes round and round and round. Yes. Do you find it, uh, any of the narratives stronger than the other? Um, yes. So as we're going to talk about foreign fighters, like this is something that has really exploded. Like Al-Qaeda, Al this was like, there were not that many foreign fighters. It was not a big thing. Um, and then ISIS kind of made like being going and fighting in, in a holy war. Um, which is like what was happening in Syria and Iraq. Um, that was kind of the, the draw for the foreign fighters, like come fight the holy war here. That was a really big narrative that motivated people because instead of taking your grievances in America, so if you're a Muslim and you feel um, disenfranchised in America, or if you're a Muslim and you feel disenfranchised in the UK, right? And that's a big thing that happened after 9-11, right? You did feel like you were disenfranchised. You felt like maybe you never... Maybe you were never even on the land that you came from, right? So maybe you were never in Pakistan. Maybe you were never in Bangladesh. But because you looked a certain way and your family was from there, suddenly you're not American. You're not British. And so that's, that's something that, you know, disenfranchises people from the culture that they live in. And then you see this opportunity, like, go fight the holy war. You're being disenfranchised. It's the war against Islam. And then you have people going, okay, well, I'm not, I, I'm not winning this fight on my home turf. Let me go fight the bigger war, right? And so that's how you move from grievance in one area and you funnel all of that by saying, you come fight with us. You're one of us. You fight the holy war. I think that that personally is 
maybe it's not a narrative so much as a mechanism. You're giving people an outlet for their discontents, for their grievances. You can't do anything about the racism that you're experiencing at home. Come fight with us. Come fight the holy war. Um, and I think that's pretty powerful. Um, any other questions? Sure. Actually, following up on that. Oh, hi, Diana Bolsinger, former National Counterterrorism Center Group Chief, now uh, running the Intelligence and uh, National Security Studies pro graduate program here at UTEP. Uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> Good to meet you. Um, I'm just looking at this, and one thing we've seen, though, is an ebb and flow of mm -hmm. the foreign engagement. Right now, uh, ISIS especially and uh, Al-Qaeda are appealing to far fewer people the way you describe than they were a decade ago. Mm -hmm. How is that affecting the success of their messaging? Because I know Anwar al-Awlaki may be dead, but his recordings will play on forever. But some of the appeal that ISIS did get from being young, from being hip, from being up on the latest in Western culture, they don't quite have that anymore. Do you see an impact? Yeah, so I think that the, the goal of this first block is really to talk about how social media became a thing. And I was actually going to get to that. Oh, so, okay. right, no, 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 please, thank you for bringing that up. That's a really, really good point. Like anything else, people get tired of hearing the same thing over and over and over. What's trendy at one point in time, people will lose interest. They're on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. But the thing that is dangerous, that has come out of all of it, is propagation through propaganda. And if you don't get anything else out of this block, that's the thing that you should remember. Propagation through propaganda, which makes this really impossible to fight, right? We're dealing with this. Your kids are going to deal with this. Your kids' kids are going to deal with this because it's never going to go away. So maybe the IS message is no longer flashy. It's no longer attracting people. But the offshoots, and actually this is something I was going to talk about later, but this is a good segue. The offshoots of those groups are, or copycats of those groups, they don't want to innovate because, okay, think about a business, right? When you have a business, if you innovate and you really change up the game, there's significant risk, right? You run the risk of failing. You run the risk of losing a lot of money, right? Like don't, sometimes people are like, don't fix what's broken. However, if you innovate, there is a really big chance, or not a chance, but there is a small chance that you'll change the game. ISIS innovated. Al-Qaeda innovated, but ISIS really innovated. And ISIS changed the game. So now you have other groups, smaller groups, offshoots, and they're like, why are we going to innovate when this worked so well for them? So then they're taking this model of appealing to people's grievances, democratizing social media, making you know their soldiers really people on the internet, people who are going to draw people to their cause. And you can use that tactic to bring anybody onto any ideology or any cause uh, if you can appeal to them in the right way. So like you were saying, there are ebbs and flows. They're not attracting as many fighters. But I'm, I'm not, a, not a psychic. I don't predict the future. But um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. I think that we might be overdue in the silence because when people are really angry about something, when people are really engaged in something, there's not a whole lot of breathing air to introduce something else. Things have calmed down a little bit, like you said, right? And so now we're kind of just waiting for somebody to fill that space, right? And that's what I'm saying about trends, right? In the early 2000s, low rise jeans were the thing. I was a teenager. It was terrible, right? We've moved on. Now there were high-rise jeans, there were mid-rise jeans, there were all mom jeans, all of these things. And now guess what? Low-rise jeans are coming back. It just has to be something that people aren't sick of yet. And so in the same way, there are cycles. Jihadism is never going anywhere, but it may come back in a different way. And that's kind of what we don't know. You know, who is gonna be the next big thing? And this is kind of what the research 
that we're talking about, about trend forecasting and fashion forecasting, how can we pick up on what is going to be the next big thing before it reaches that tipping point? Does that make sense? So maybe it's not ISIS, but jihadism will be alive and well, for sure. And in an ever globalized world, I, do I doubt that foreign fighters are going to be a thing of the past, if, if that makes sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Sure. Um, so unofficial social media, right? This isn't like one of the guys who was commissioned by Al-Qaeda to spread the message of Al-Qaeda. This mm -hmm. was just some random person on the internet who is, you know, an ISIS person. And he's like talking about like his, his favorite movies or something like that, right? Um, does anybody know who this is? Yeah, it's really funny because last time, last night Barnett was talking to me about these slides and he was like, oh, you know, like maybe you're not interested in jihadism. Maybe you're interested in Bieberism. And I was like, is that a thing? Bieberism? Like, do people say that? Um, so funny. But, you know, the, the thing is here, you can stumble upon this discussion any which way. Like you're talking about Bambi, you're talking about Justin Bieber, right? You can stumble upon this discussion any which way. And he, the, the guy, Mujahid for Life, he goes, now I'm actually worried that people will start to follow me because they want to hear about my favorite movies instead of reporting jihad, um, which is like a kind of tongue in cheek way. But say I'm like interested in a movie and I stumble upon this discussion um, because the internet recommends it to me because I was watching The Lion King or something. Um, the vast majority of people would be like, okay, cool not going to like take this too seriously. But if you have, I think this guy had like 70,000 followers or something like that. 1% of 70,000 followers who stumble upon this and they're like, huh, you know, this jihadism thing. I don't know too much about it. Let me, let me learn more. And then the more, once you enter that, it's like you become radicalized by, a, it's not like you see one thing and you're like, Going to Syria, guys. No. <laughs> they draw you in slowly, right? Uh, they're not going to bombard you with the most extreme, with the most violent, with the most, you know, shocking content at first. You get drawn in degree by degree. And then at a certain point, all logical arguments, all counter arguments, all reasonable arguments, they fail to appeal to you anymore because you are so deep in and your echo chamber, does anybody know what an echo chamber means? Yeah. Uh, it's just everybody has the same opinion, so you never get any dissension within the group. Exactly, exactly. You're being drawn in, and then any argument, you have a whole bunch of other people around you saying, yeah, but they're saying this because, they're saying this because, they're saying this because. And then you get, it's harder to appeal to those people once they're being so drawn far away. Also, on traditional social media, it's very unlikely that like the hardcore stuff is happening on Twitter, is happening on Reddit. What that does, though, is it draws people in. And then the more that you demonstrate that you're willing, the more you get funneled into maybe private chats, encrypted chats, WhatsApp, um, Telegram. Does anybody know what Telegram is? Yes. Yeah. OK. WhatsApp, Telegram. Um, and now that is where the real conversation happens. And then eventually, if if you really, really get that far, then you go dark web, right? And that's something that we have no control over. We don't, we can't access it. We can't monitor it. We just have no ability to see what's going on there. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But this is actually one of my favorite anecdotes. There was a British girl and she had about 30,000 followers and she was obsessed with Justin Bieber, obsessed. Her whole account was fangirling, Justin Bieber. So, you know, 30,000 Bieber followers. Cool. Um, and then she actually started saying something. She was becoming radicalized by the Islamic State teenage girl. Um, and casually in the midst of Justin Bieber discussions, she's throwing out ISIS hashtags, right? Again, 30,000 people. That's a lot of people. 1% of people who get curious because they encountered the jihadist messaging via their like of Justin Bieber, that's, that's a big risk, right? Like 30,000 people, that's a lot. Um, and so it's also something to note that 
This is how influence online works. You build trust with your audience, with your followers, because you have something in common or because they can relate with you or relate to you in some certain way where they feel like they know you, they trust you because you share something in common. And so actually, let's, let me ask you a question. How many of you have liked an article without reading it? No one, right? No. Never? You've no never one. liked something online? Not without reading it. Yeah. Well, good for you guys. <laughs> uh, no, that's, that's pretty. I mean, I'm guilty of that. You know what I mean? If I see it's coming from the Washington Post, I feel like that's a reputable news source. If I see that it's coming from an academic that has studied that subject that I know and trust, I don't necessarily think to question where this is coming from, what the validity of it. That's an expert, that person. I know what they, they know what they're talking about. So I'm gonna re re retweet, share, whatever, um, because it's coming from a reputable source. That's how trust online works. And that's kind of why we're all in these echo chambers, because if you ask the person who posted that article, I would tell you there's a significant risk that they haven't read it either. They were retweeting from someone that they trust. And this is how influence works online. This is how trust works online. You trust people you know who have something in common with you. And that's how echo chambers get built. Everybody around you shares the same opinion as you, and you build your social networks around there. And then machine learning and you know, predictive modeling, the social media sites won't get you hooked. So they're just gonna recommend and show you more of the same. And then you're not hearing any counter arguments. You're not hearing any alternative positions. And it's actually really interesting. I'm reading this book called The Intelligent Tra Intelligence Trap, Why Smart People Make Dumb Decisions. And it's actually some of the smartest people who have the most bias because they think that they're intelligent and the people in their circles are intelligent. And so they're, they must be right. They're, they don't have a lot of experience previously of being wrong or not being right. And so they're actually the most closed off to their own biases. And I think that we're seeing that here in the political climate. I'm not going to be political at all in this, uh, in this discussion. But what I want to say is, I think that to some degree, we're all guilty of this. It's, we have information coming at us every which way. It is impossible to be a 100% responsible citizen in this information climate. So we have to rely on cues from sources that we trust from people that we trust. And we just have to take their word for it sometimes. Or else we just don't engage at all, which I think is the smarter thing to do if you don't know what you're talking about. But, um, you know, this is how opinions get formed. This isn't just an extremism problem. This isn't just a Justin Bieber problem. You know, this is a problem of the fact that we cannot evaluate critically every single in piece of information that we encounter, especially online. So diffusion, actually this girl went on to, uh, to be a foreign fighter, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more. So diffusion, this is kind of where we're going out with copycats, right? So this is like the Boogaloo boys, they like made um, a first infantry of mimetic warfare or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically <laughs> they're looking at the things that have, you know, Boogaloo boys have nothing to do with ISIS, I don't think, um, but they're looking at what ISIS did right. <laughs> and they're saying, hey, this is easy enough. And they, you know, that's how radicalization has really, really accelerated. And this is the other thing I want you to remember. Maybe social media isn't contributing to the rise of terrorist attacks in the way that you would think, like planning on social media for an attack, um, things of that nature. Generally speaking, some exceptions, I want to qualify everything here. People who are going to commit like domestic acts of terror, foreign acts of terror, don't plan them on Twitter, right? But radicalization, has increased because of social media and because of the way that extremists have democratized social media. So they're just kind of copying what ISIS did and they're pretty successful at it, right? So let's talk about the impact of social media and the internet today. And I would actually like, this is kind of, where, where, at, where are we with time? Oh, we are? Okay. So th this is, um, how many of you watch cable news. 
Cable yeah, like Fox, CNN, NBC. Okay. How many of you would say that you get the bulk of your news from, you consume the most news from cable news? Not a lot. Okay. Print news? Like the newspaper? <laughs> okay. <laughs> they do? Online versions. Yeah. version. Okay, well that was gonna be my next question. How many of you access news directly from the source? Like how many of you go to www.newyorktimes.washingtonpost? Okay, that's pretty, that's pretty decent. All right, so you go to the news source and you read. You don't get it through any other way. All right, how many of you get your news or figure out what is you know, happening in current events in society? How many of you get the most media exposure from social media or other types of online forums? Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty standard, right? Herein lies the problem. So you're not getting sort of an accurate distribution of news. You're getting things that are going to appeal to what you already believe, right? Either because it's shared by someone who has stuff in common with you, either because you have liked, followed, whatever, the New York Times, Washington Post, and then you're getting a lot of recommendations that are similar to those news outlets. And it's algorithms. It's all machine learning. If you like this, you're likely to like this. If you like this, you're likely to like this. If you retweet something with a hashtag, they're going to look at who has used that hashtag, what they have in common with you, and provide you with that content front and center, right? And that's kind of the problem. That's how we get into these echo chambers. But it's very, very unlikely that if you get it from a source that you trust, you're, you're gonna question the legitimacy. And I don't know how many people deliberately go and look at whatever your political views are, with whatever your ideological views are. I don't know of any people that really deliberately seek out opposing viewpoints. Um, because it, you know, I, I do too. <laughs> and, and it's only because you want to understand mm -hmm. the other side, and not because you want to, uh, you want to see what's actually being fed because you want to have the whole picture as a HSI Sappho Paso. Um, and I've been a panelist, also a um, Middle Eastern analyst when I was in the Air Force. And so you want to know what's being fed in order to counter direct what is actually being fed to those people. Mm -hmm. um, because that's because when you come back to the, the way social media, everything is going, you have this logarithm that even when you do a query, even if it's a topic that you have no bias in, but you want to have both perspectives, it's already been filtered Eek. for you. So it's creating that echo chamber in all respects of your life. Exactly. Like Thank you. That's exactly where I was going with this. Did my, did how's it work for me? No, even I if love it, the way you, you're like building it up and I was just like, oh. Right on, right on the money. Well, thank you so much. I'm really, I'm happy to know that people are engaged with this. My point was, which she made very eloquently, <coughs> even if you try to seek out information that is the opposite of what you believe, the internet makes it difficult. Google's algorithms make it difficult for you to access opposing viewpoints because what, what do you want? You want people to continue to engage. People continue to engage if they're consuming stuff that agrees with them, right? And like, what do you call it? Confirmation bias? The more you see that, you know, agrees with your positions that you agree with. Sorry, I'm a little rusty, very tired. Um, so the more that you see your ideas and your beliefs reflected back at you, the more strongly, strongly you believe those things. So as a researcher, sometimes it's difficult for me to access the information that I need. Truly. And so you were saying like you have to know what the other side is saying so you can effectively counter narrative. Um, so a narrative is basically just like a story, like an idea. What are we saying? Um, you know, what are we trying to get people to believe? If you don't know what the other side is saying, how can you form a counter narrative? How can you oppose that viewpoint if you don't even know what they're saying? This is a big problem. Um, so thank you. The traditional sources of information are suffering a crisis of legitimacy. I'm not going to be political here, but we all know Fox News, CNN, we all know. I'm trying to be uh, professional here. Nobody thinks that they're like great sources of unbiased information, 
one way or the other. Even if you love CNN, even if you love Fox News, even the most die hard, like far left, far right, nobody's like CNN, quality reporting. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And so this is how we're going to the democratization of information. Like you don't look at traditional news sources with the same trust that you used to, right? Walter Cronkite, right? Everyone trusted Walter Cronkite. He was legitimate. There are no Walter Cronkites anymore, you know? They, they just don't exist. Oh, sorry. Yes. Do you think local news is any better? Um, yes. Only, only because I feel like local news is telling you what's going on in your community and you don't necessarily have a lot of bias in that regard. I don't know. At least I live in New York City. I don't find that local news in New York City is biased because they're just reporting all the terrible things that are happening. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. um, but I, what about you? What do you think? I don't, I, it seems better, but that's really like, I, I do watch local news or like listen to, listen to news on the radio. Mm -hmm. But I was just kind of wondering, it, it seems less biased because like, It'll touch on local stuff, and then it seems more like fair with the national level stuff that is on the local news. Yeah. So I kind of have the I'll watch that in the mornings, but yeah, and I mean, cable anyone, so. I I watch local news, but that's because I find it soothing. Which don't I don't I don't know why. <laughs> um, but actually, how many people do watch local news? Impressive. Okay. Um, that's good for me to know. Um, okay, so face-to-face -face interactions are increasingly being replaced or augmented by virtual ones. How many people would disagree with that? Okay, so actually usually when we talk about this, people are like, no, social media is never going to replace real-world interaction. And most of those people, I'm like, all right, think about your kids. Do you have teenagers? You know, how much of their life is spent staring at a screen? It's actually, we're gonna talk about this a little bit more, but digital life is really supplanting physical life as the basis for what people believe about themselves. When I was in high school, I was not popular. I was nerdy, I did speech and debate. I was not popular, but at least, <laughs> at least I knew that the popular kids in school, like that was the dynamic here. There's nothing else going on. Kids in high school now, how popular you are, depends on how many likes you get, if, if somebody who has the most followers, if they follow you, that means you're popular. Imagine how stressful that is for kids. Imagine how like desperately you want to portray yourself as something who, as someone who people are going to respect and like and want to be friends with. It's very difficult. Um, and then here's the thing. My sister is a publicist. Barnett's sister is a publicist. And they will tell you Messaging now can be tailored. First of all, advertising used to be so expensive. Getting a spot in a magazine for your advertisement, super expensive. A commercial, super expensive. A billboard, super expensive. Now, advertising is cheap. And we have all of this information, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more in the machine learning segment. You have all of this information that you can directly target. If you wanna know somebody who likes, I don't know, Disney, who's 14 years old and has enough disposable income to ask their mom to buy Disney Plus or whatever, right? Their family is, you know, well off enough that they could buy a subscription. You can target those people and just those people. It's very effective. It's very fast. It's very cheap. Um, and like we talked about echo chamber effects all, again. Um, so lower risks and costs to propagandists, right? Like we said, if you're going to build out like a whole media campaign like Al-Qaeda, right? Super big operations, super formal. That's expensive. And it's a huge time commitment. And it takes a whole, it's a news organization. But if you can just like target, you know, this person with this message, this person with this message, it's cheap, it's easy, it's agile. It's a lot better for propagandists. Um, and then radicaliz radicalization timeline. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, sorry, well, yes, yeah. I'm just curious, do you think there's a way to actively desensitize Google to give these people material that they, even if it's not personal to them, it, it's obvious this is not good for this person to have. 
yeah um we're gonna talk about it like and this is this is i mean I'm, I'm gonna speak frankly and we can talk about this online as somebody who works in tech trust and safety um the tech companies are not gonna solve this issue you know what i mean at the end of the day corporations are corporations they try and be responsible but that's not their end game that's not their bottom line uh, and so i think it's really the advertisers that are like the problem here and they aren't i'm not saying they're not doing anything they are there are a lot of really dedicated people who care about sensitive content online or extremist content online that are doing great work it's just when it competes with business interests they're not the people who are going to solve the problem is what i'm trying to say um and then we talked about radicalization timelines accel accelerating right actually going back to this actually no 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 mm. is on a volunteer basis because they are looking at that one Instagram person, right, that they've been following, and all of a sudden they put in that jihad, and subconsciously they didn't even recognize that now they start to look at that person and they look at all the other postings that have a nexus to it. So because it happens so slowly, I believe that the media and all these uh, marketers are like, well, it, it's not that fast and it's not like in your face and because it's not happening in your face, then we're hands off because it happens so slowly. One little trigger is all that needs to happen to get the person voluntarily the end because that's the key is that nothing is being forced on the consumer that it's like they still have their own self will. And that's why do you want to come up here and give this lecture I, I, for I, I, me? I, I, so. like you want to like you want to just tag team this because like <laughs> you're no you're making all of the right points truly. Yes, and so and so when people say oh like how do we attack this? It is so difficult to attack it because it is so subconsciously the person is doesn't even recognize that it's happening to them that before you know it you know, it can take a while, but they will get there. They will get there on their own. And because they get there on their own and no one is forcing them, they have become completely radicalized to the extent that they no longer are. And this is what happens to war fighters. They're not, they no longer have a, an attachment or a resemblance to where they came from or their family. This was all done voluntarily on their own premise but they don't realize all the psychological warfare that's happening because of marketers, because of the way things are actually happy, happening on social media and they themselves seek it. Yes, and we are gonna talk about this a lot in the second block. Um, so I actually, I'm, I'm going a little over here. We're gonna talk about going dark. Um, this is a really important slide. So from 2005 to 2010, three quarters of extremists did not use social media. In the next five years, 2011 to 2006, 16, three quarters of extremists did have social media engagement, right? And this is really, yes. I'm so sorry. I'm just wondering, what is the group of extremists that is included in this? Are you looking at purely Islamic? Are you including domestic? Are you looking at other ideolo ideologies or nationalist groups? Great question. So this is from uh, PIRUS, which is a data set at START, which is start, stands for the Profiles of Individuals Radicalized in the United States. So this is all ideologies. Is there jihadism, right-wing extremism, there's like, I don't know, spaghetti monster people, everybody who, and you can look at the, you can look at the inclusion criteria on, it's start.umd.edu. I think it's in there somewhere. Uh, and you can take a look at the inc inclusion criteria. And it's very good because you can filter for what you want. If you want things included, if you don't, um, you can look at the stats in different ways. Um, so the thing about this is, what's important to take away here, radicalization is getting faster. Not so much that this is facilitating terrorist activity or violent extremism, but radicalization is getting faster. There is a very famous case of you know, an ISIS supporter called Greenbird76. Does anybody know why he's called Greenbird76? Because he got taken down and came back up 76 times. In and of itself, that gave him so much, like, 
prestige, authority. People were going to him and asking for advice about how to be such a good propagandist or how to be such a good recruiter for the Islamic State. Guess where Greenbird 76 was from? Pennsylvania. He had nothing to do with the Islamic State, literally nothing. He had no credentials, but he was so respected and so revered because every time they shut him down, he came back. He was not like a religious scholar. He just was a random guy. He just kept coming back, right? Um, and so this might not seem like a really big deal. However, one of your statesmen from Texas, sorry, um, you know, heard of Greenbird 76 because he was really, really popular. Uh, and so he contacted him and he said, hey man, you know, I'm kind of interested in going to fight with the Islamic State. You know how I can do that. This guy is from Pennsylvania. He has no idea. However, he has attracted so much attention from people who really do have connections to the Islamic State and ties to the Islamic State. And he was able to connect them with these people. And they were able to facilitate this person's passage to Turkey and facilitated his visa and all of these things. And then he actually was funneled through Turkey into Syria and he fought with the Islamic State. So it seems like these things are like no big deal, haha, ha, Greenbird 76, but they, it really is a problem. Um, and then, you know, somebody else, right, has like 70,000 follower, followers or maybe 20,000 followers, right? You shut them down as a tech company or the government. You're like, great, you know, did, did something good. We took him offline. All he has to do is catch the attention of someone who hasn't been shut down. He, he t uh, does hashtag Bikia family, which is, you know, a group of propagandists. He's like, give me a shout out in his new account within five hours he's got 70% of his followers back. And now he's more legitimate because he's come back. So that's something to think about. All right, social media activities by extremists. Uh, the goal here, I'm gonna be really quick about this. The thing to take away from this is, people are not just consuming content. Extremists are not just consuming content. They're not reading it and going back to their daily lives. Most people who have been identified as extremists are contributing something, disseminating, participating in dialogue, creating content, establishing relationships. 21.3% of extremists in the United States are establishing relationships with extremists, extremists who do perpetrate offline extremist violence, right? 1736 facilitate foreign travel to a conflict zone. Think about that. And this is why the Islamic State was able to attract 446,000 foreign fighters to come fight in Iraq and Syria. 446,000. And like what, they, they were coming up, you know, after 2010. That is extremely significant. And so you can see how this has accelerated radicalization. It used to take however X many number of months to radicalize, uh, to radicalize someone in 2005. And you can just see this curve getting flat right? Propagation through propaganda. And it's getting faster and faster and faster every day. Um, okay. Yes. Double-edged sword. If you're planning an attack out in the open, right, it's easier to find you and stop you, but it is accelerating radicalization. So not so much attacks, but radicalization. This is the takeaway here. Um, so what does this mean for you? And I'll be super quick. And if, if I can, we've covered a lot in the second block. So there is difficulty in identifying who's a threat online. So, you know, there are intelligence agencies who put people who will inf infiltrate extremist groups. You don't know if this is a British intelligence agency. You don't know if this is the CIA. You don't know if this is a researcher who is, you know, engaging with an extremist community online. You don't know. However, going dark is sometimes a key indication of warning. Does anyone know what going dark is? Yeah, so going dark is you see somebody online and they are becoming more and more and more and more and more radical. They're engaging in more violent, more shocking, uh, you know, discussions online, things like that, and then they disappear. Historically, that has been a good indicator that that person is preparing to commit an act of violence, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, you know, that's one way you can look at it from like, if you're gonna monitor the internet, um, but also sometimes going dark can just mean that they've moved on to the dark web. They've moved on to increasingly more um, nefarious sites and like forums for conversation. But that's also still very problematic. If someone who's really active on Twitter just disappears, there is a likelihood they've just gotten tired of it, got a girlfriend, whatever. Uh, Bill Brainup, who is the director of Start, he used to say, 
Um, you know, like sometimes like jihadism is like using a dating app, like engaging in jihadist discussion online. Like you're like, oh man, I really need a girlfriend, like whatever. Um, you know, I'm not like super happy with my life. So I'm on these apps. How many people have used a dating app? Okay, well, you know, right? Like you get tired of it. You're like, whatever, I don't like this anymore. You find a girlfriend. And then a couple of months later, you break up or, you know, your life isn't that interesting, back on the dating app, right? So sometimes this happens. Um, but I think this goes back to the point that I made earlier and we can talk about it a little bit more. It's up to all of us to sort of be aware of our online environment, build trust for those of you who have students, right? Build trust with your students, build trust among your students. Um, for those of you who teach, build trust with law enforcement so you can go to them in confidence and say, I think this might be a problem. One of my students has said this, right? And trust that they're not going to then go and treat that student unfairly, right? Um, and I think, you know, law enforcement, this is really important. Um, community oriented policing is not the subject of this uh, discussion, but it is really important for people, generally speaking, to trust law enforcement so that they can go in confidence and say, I think there might be a problem here. I'm seeing somebody become more radical. Can you, you know, check this out and be careful about it? However, and constitutional protections, the government can't go and investigate and shut down everything. You know, if your 14 year old is in your basement saying like crazy stuff, right? You're the only person really who's in a position to intervene there. The government can't do it. Law enforcement can't do it. It's your job, right? And then community members must be appropriately trained. The UK Prevent Program, sorry, what time is it? I'm almost done. Um, the UK Prevent Program was a disaster because it was like a see something, say something program. And there was a four-year-old who was in daycare and he drew a picture of a cucumber. Um, and the teacher was going to report him to counter-terrorism, counter-extremism prevention organization because she thought he was Muslim and he had a picture of his dad holding a cucumber and she heard cooker bomb. <laughs> a four-year-old, right? So you, you can't make people into citizen vigilantes, like make citizens arrest. He's four, right? We don't want that either. But I think that there is a certain amount of education and personal responsibility that we should all take on. Sorry, I went so much longer. <laughs> how, much, how much attention is your center or your, where you work or whatever you do uh, being focused on the Mexican cartels and the publication that they're doing with the youth in Mexico? I mean, now we have kids, 60, 50 year olds, committing murders, 50 calibers. They're literally missing a mile away, about yeah. three quarters of a mile, maybe walk, walking distance. Maybe that, I mean, how much, how much of that does, do they even care about? So we are not a criminology center, but the person who was the director for a long time, Gary LaFree, he is the head of the criminology department at UMG. So we did look at it a little bit. It just wasn't really our bread and butter. Um, I think that actually there was an intern of mine who worked with me on one of these machine learning programs. And she actually went on um, to do a lot of um, online cartel sort of study and work. Um, and I think actually now she works, I can't remember, but I'll figure out who she is and I'll, I'll direct Absolutely. you to some of her resources. Um, she, she did a lot of really good work. Um, but actually you guys are such a great group. Thank you so much for being so, uh, for your participation. Uh, I hope I didn't bore you. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you.